Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. My name is Fei Yu. I'm the Managing Director of Europe at Alco Global. Today, we have the pleasure to welcome Brian White. Brian is the Head of Supply Chain Management and MD for Swarovski AG. Prior to Swarovski, Brian worked in consulting for 18 years with PwC and EY helping global retail consumer and industrial companies transform the business through end-to-end -end integration of supply chain and operations. Brian started his leadership journey in production and supply chain roles for Tate & Lyle, the Sugars and Sweeteners company. Brian, great to have you. Hi, hey, thanks. Good to be here. Please tell us about you. What are your current responsibilities and how did you make your career from consulting to be where you are today? Yeah, thanks. So, so, so what are my responsibilities? So, so I look after the end-to-end -end supply chain for Swarovski and it is truly end-to-end. -end. I mean, we're a retailer, we're a consumer goods, finished goods manufacturer. And we actually make our heritage is in making the, uh, the key crystal components itself. So all the way from the customer, right back to the source of the sand that goes into the crystal. And I look after the planning, the logistics and the order management for that around the world. Fantastic. And then you haven't shared, right? How did you develop your career from consulting to where you are today? That's an impressive yeah. career. Yeah, so when I left university, I was looking around trying to work out what I wanted to do. And actually in the holidays, I'd worked in a factory in a quality lab. Um, and I really enjoyed the immediacy and the action of working in the factory, which led me to applying for production management trainee roles when I was leaving university. And the one that worked, the company I liked, the company that liked me were Tate and Lyle, the sugar company. And initially I was based in the UK worked in Europe and worked in Africa as well, which was really good to understand you know, the end to end from the agriculture to the refining to the shelf. Towards the end of the 90s, I was looking for, for a change and I was either going to do another role internally within Tate and Lyle or at that time, consulting was really booming as an industry. So I joined PwC. So I went into consulting with you know, the clear view, the clear plan, this is for a couple of years. I'm going to get some breath and you know, I'm going to sort of experience other companies and other, other industries. And I stayed there for 18 years. You know, I enjoyed the breath. I enjoyed the, the change of industries, the change of countries, the change of cultures that you had within consulting. That was fantastic. After a, a long period, I, I was really, really realizing that I was working on long transformation programs, but I was missing that sort of deep personal accountability of being the decision maker. And that's what led me to start looking at roles back in industry, rather than as, as a consultant, as an external person leading a project. And so therefore I started to, to search, looking for, for a role back in the industry. And the company that liked me, the company I liked, the one that got lucky was with Swarovski, which also had a move to Switzerland with it, which was exciting. For us as uh, families, we moved from, we were based in the UK to Switzerland. And that's been the last four years. Great story. Um, I've actually heard from many consultants, right, who have run supply chain transformation. And so you actually have the wide scope across sectors. And then yeah. later on, you feel like you want to own your, own, your baby, right? Run it by yourself. Mm. Uh, so now you're doing it. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So, Brian, what do you believe are, are the most important skills and traits for a successful supply chain leader? And how have you developed those qualities over time? Yeah. So, so I'd start with optimism and realism as two things together. One, one thing we talk about a lot within the supply chain team is a, a glass half full mindset. So yeah, I think in supply chain as a profession, we've trained ourselves to focus on exceptions, on the problems. We've done it with our processes. We've done it with our software as well. It flags up 
exceptions all the time. However, that, the risk is you end up seeing the glass half empty if you're only looking at the, uh, the problem. So it's really important that you focus on the optimistic side of what's working as well as what you need to, uh, to fix. I think the second thing in there is you need to have a real energy and a drive to understand how the end-to-end the -end of the supply chain really works you know, from your customer or your, your customer's customers. You know, what is it they're really after? And how does that drive the demand or how does that drive a need all the way through your supply chain and through to your suppliers as well? Because with that real sort of understanding of how the ecosystem works, you can manage the risks and you can see opportunities within it. I think that's really important. Hmm. That's beautifully said, right? So you need to be really strong, have a strong mind and physical <laughs> status ready to go through all these difficulties uh, through the supply chain. Thank you for sharing. So you, I, I know that you're an advocate of effective communication. And mm -hmm. that's really one of the key skills for supply chain leaders. In your experience, what are some of the biggest challenges that supply chain leaders face in terms of communicating effectively in the business? Yeah, so th three things. So one is language. Two, I think I touched on is the positivity. And the third thing is, is the context that we're operating within. So, so with, with the language, yeah, I think supply chain can be quite technical. You know, we have a lot of technology, we have optimizers, we have algorithms, you know, we have OTIF, we have A to P, we have SNOP, we have IBP. It's a real, there's a real language around it. And I think that's good. And when supply chain is talking to supply chain, that we, you can use the same language and you can get through it, through to it quickly. You know, however, when, when you're trying to engage a commercial colleague, you, know, you need to change the way you're, you're speaking to the way that they talk about their customers or you know, about the revenue or about the margin. So I think there's value in both sets of language, but it's really important that you're really aware of the audience that you're talking to at any point in time. I think that's really the key. Could you give an example? Uh, like, like if you have all these... Yeah, I mean, right? how do you yeah, for one, two, two things that come to mind is in our supply chain planning, we have a set of graphs which we use, which allow us to, to talk supply chain to supply chain. Mm. You know, they're, they're quite technical, they're quite detailed, and we're looking at a number of different factors, you know, be it the order profile, you know, be it the factory performance and the inventory, all in one go. Not a great tool for talking to a sales director or talking to, uh, to finance. So we need to put the information in a different, more engaging way for that audience. Another one we were talking about just the other day, actually, is, you know, talking about overstock. DIO, you know, DIO's inventory outstanding is quite dry and quite technical. I always like what Unilever called it. They called it slob, you know, mm -hmm. slow moving and obsolete. I mean, that, <laughs> the clue is in the title that you, you've really got to do something about the slobs. Mm. Very interesting. So now it's actually, how would you summarize it? It's uh, to communicate in a way that is, you mentioned positive, right? Remain positive. So positive and tailored to the audience. Yeah, so what, tailored to what the are audience. they really interested in? Yeah, what is the decision? What's the facts that are supporting your recommendation? Yeah, and how do you keep that really crisp and really simple? I think the third thing I mentioned was the context as mm. well. Yeah, I think the, yeah, particularly through COVID, one of the things we were realizing is that we were talking very much about our business and our attention and our pressure. However, if we looked at seasonal retailers, you know, everyone had a lot of the, the same problems. I mean, the standout time for us was for 2021, when the sort of the lockdowns of 2020 were over from a retail perspective. But we, we manufacture a lot of goods in Southeast Asia and Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, we're all having big lockdowns in our summer, in the, the Western summer of 2021, which really put Christmas at risk. And I was at a, a sales conference that we had in October where the number one question was, what are we going to sell at Christmas? You know, the, the factories are shut. We had people camping in the factories trying to pop up tents, trying to keep some production running. Wow. And in this sales conference, I sort of opened the meeting by saying, okay, so 
We're in the Tyrol, beautiful part of Austria. The mm. ski season's coming. Who wants a new ski jacket? Mm. You know, what, what, what are you planning to do? And, you know, there's a lot of Swiss guys here. You know, you like Mammut. Mm. Where's Mammut manufactured? Vietnam. Mm. North Face. Where do North Face manufacture a lot of their winter clothing? Yeah, that's in Cambodia. So, guys, we're experiencing the same problems as the rest of the in industry. And the key is going to be, yeah, how do we sell what we've got? And how do we prioritize what's coming on the boat? It changed the dynamic, basically broadened the conversation. Mm. Give us an, another example when you feel that was your best meeting, right? It, it, it could be then your consulting time or your time at Swarovski. So your best meeting with the top management that you feel, yeah, I made it. That was a good communication. So I think the best meeting we had was any meeting as a consultant or working in industry is where you have a, a really clear proposal and where you've made a really robust recommendation. You know, with, with Swarovski, the first thing I did was review the global logistics network that we had. And the reason for the review was that you know, Swarovski had a long history of direct store deliveries. You know, all the shops around the world are very present and the whole logistics network was set up to fulfill stores very well, very efficiently. Yeah, however, the world, you know, four years ago when we started, and even more so now is omni-channel. You know, e-com has really grown. You know, customers expect to be able to move across channels with ease. And we went through quite a detailed analysis to look at what is the customers really asking for and how do we respond to it? And our response was very different and very radical, but also quite an emotional challenge for the organization because we were proposing to go from an own managed central global distribution center, great for fulfilling stores, into a set of regional distribution centers. How do you approach stakeholder management as a supply chain leader? Share us some of your strategies um, that you feel yeah. that is most effective in building relationships. So I think the focus on the informal or the personal, as well as the formal meeting structures that are in place. So my mindset is to try and make my, make sure I'm available. And by that, I mean, you know, am I available to, to my teams? So do I walk the floors? Do I visit the sites? Do I talk to people? And do I make myself available to the commercial people as well? So something I learned in consulting, actually, was that it's amazing if you go and sit by the coffee machine, there's always a sofa, there's always a table, there's always some chairs there. And yeah, even on our own offices, I'll go and sit in the coffee area, I'll make sure I'm in the open plan area, and everybody walks past. You know, everybody from, from the CEO to the leaders to the analysts to the cleaners. You know, so yeah, if you're available, you, know, you can stop, chat, you know, find out what's going on. And I extend that to going into stores as well. So if I'm in a town, I'll always pop into the store and say hello and see what's going on. Hmm. Well, that's a, a good tactic. So be available and visible and helpful with, yeah. with your stakeholders. Okay. So I, I would actually have one topic that many supply chain leaders feel difficult to balance, right? So operational efficiency is one, but you need to stay flexible mm -hmm. and adaptable. How do you balance that? in the face of challenging business need. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's difficult. I mean, that's the sort of the silver bullet, sort of the ultimate goal. And yeah, how, how do we approach it? I mean, we, we, we come at it from a point of view of being clear on our data. And so, you know, what is the commercial need? What does that drive in the cost base? Yeah, you know, how does that work as part of the, uh, the P&L? And yeah, you know, what are the drivers? What changes those costs? And then be transparent with that data, with the, the sales team and the finance colleagues. Mm -hmm. So for example, we know and we measure the different costs of fulfilling an e-com order to a store order. For us to send something to your house or a Dropbox at the you know, Zurich HB, it's about five times more expensive than us to ship one unit to a store. You know, you, you've got no economies of scale. So the logistics costs are high. 
However, the, the commercial cost to serve is lower because you're shopping on your phone. You know, we haven't got the full store infrastructure. So it's really important for us as a business to understand how the, the P&L works. And that allows us to make the right choices, investing more in e-com advertising or into the store. But we know what it drives in terms of profitability. Mm. Another thing we try to keep our eye on in terms of efficiency as well is you know, value-added services or you know, the clues in the title. How do we gift wrap? How do we add thank you cards? You know, these are all things in an e-com parcel that take time and effort. Yeah, and we need to make sure that they're adding value and test that we actually get that it is profitable and it really is value adding. Or yeah, we do special packing for, for different customers, for different stores that they have. We need to review those requirements regularly to make sure it still works for the customer. They still see it as value adding. So I think it's keeping the P&L knowledge, you know, what drives your costs, and, and keeping an active conversation to make sure that the investment you're making is actually delivering the profit. Otherwise, you need to focus on the efficiency and simplify things. Mm. Yeah, that's helpful insight. Of course, when we talk about right the driving efficiency and, and adapting, we need to talk about the COVID time. And I heard that Swarovski went through a difficult time. So how has COVID impacted uh, Swarovski's supply chain? And what steps did you take to mitigate the disruption and challenges? Yeah, so, so I mean, just on the context there, you're, you're absolutely right. It was, it was difficult. You know, we are a retailer and we're a luxury discretionary product. And it was very hard you know, in, the, in 2020 in particular to sell when our store network was closed or we didn't know when it was going to be closed or when it was going to be opened. Fortunately, we were a long way through our logistics transformation at the time. So we did have regional distribution center network set up, which allowed us to pick up with e -com. It didn't compensate fully the store sale drop, but we went from about 10% to, to 25 to 30% sales through the e-com channel. And in fact, in, in a couple of months in the UK, yeah, we had like 95% of our sales were e -com. So that was really a, a lifeline for us as a business. Yeah, I think the, in terms of what did we learn? Well, we learned you've definitely got to get your inventory and have it strategically deployed. So that was a, a positive thing that we had. Things that we learned that were, were more of a shock and not so encouraging was we'd, we'd gone a long way to single sourcing products from factories, either our own factories or, or partner factories. And, and that made sense when we were focusing on costs. We would only have the development costs for one factory. And actually, you know, jewelry, there's a, there's a large degree of artisan craftsmanship in, uh, in jewelry still. So that they became very good at those items. But if Vietnam's locked down, mm. Vietnam's locked down and nothing's coming out. So, so we had to you know, rapidly work out how we increased our multi-sourcing share. So, so we had you know, at least two options, for, particularly for our, for our best sellers. And we'd gone too far cost in that case, where we needed to invest more in the flexibility. I think the other thing that we, we worked hard on was making sure that we decentralized the decision making as well. So this regional distribution center network I was describing, where we had the inventory deployed, you know, we ran our SNOE, our sales and operations execution, you know, at that level. So the person in the US worked with the US market and made the, the right local, you know, fulfillment prioritization decisions. Likewise, in China, we'd make the decisions locally there as well. You know, really you know, put it to the people who were in the market and they were close to the action, close to the customer, close to the, the commercial colleagues. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there must be quite a lot of sleepless nights during that time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. really like, like the iPhone of an aeroplane mode or an off switch. I think, <laughs> it was, I think it was very difficult for a lot of people to switch off, but it was very important to, to make the time to switch off. Yeah. And there must be a, okay, also some difficult decisions to make, right? 
during that time and also ongoing as a supply chain leader. How do you communicate this kind of tough decisions to the rest of the business? Yeah, so transparently is the overall ambition. I think, you know, we, from a supply chain perspective, that there's a real sort of pleasure or a, a privilege to be able to see across the across the end to end of what's really happening. But also it's a pain, you're sort of burdened with, with some of that knowledge. And, and what we tried to make sure we were doing was communicating regularly with the sales leaders in the different markets of where were we? You know, we, we focused on availability. So what was our forward projection of which products we were gonna have when and where were they gonna be? And there was a, a permanent reconciliation you know, with the commercial planners of, you know, is that the right thing to meet that market's need? Are they the most commercial products? You know, and are we focused on the right, we call them KCPs, key consumption periods, which is not a very sexy name for, you know, Valentine's Day. You know, it, it doesn't move. Valentine's Day is Valentine's Day and you need to have the product. Yeah, you know, Easter, you know, other gifting periods. You need just to make sure we're really laser focused on availability for those uh, for those key events. Okay, that's helpful. For on the personal side or personal learning side, how do you stay mm. up to date with the latest trend and what kind of resources? Yeah, there are many many different ways. Of course, your podcasts are the perfect uh, the perfect you. way to, to stay up to date. It, it is really good to listen to peers talk about what they're doing in their business. You know, the, the similarities are reassuring and the things that they're doing differently give a real aha moment, which is really powerful. But I, I also a big believe in participating in conferences, either speaking, because the questions you get help you look at your own business in a slightly different way, or just listening to other people's stories. That's always really, really helpful. And I think it's always good to invite in business partners to share what they're thinking and, uh, and what they're seeing, you know, be it a consultancy you've used or, you know, a logistics service partner, you know, what are they seeing in the market? And I encourage the team to do the same thing. It, it keeps you fresh and it keeps you thinking. Yeah. What advice would you give to supply chain people for them to make a positive impact in their organization? Yeah, there's, 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 there's two things, I think. So one is keep curious as to how that customer need really translates through the end-to-end -end of the supply chain. So we really understand what the risks and the opportunities are. And then the other thing is take a bit of a you know, walk-in-my-shoes approach. Mm -hmm. So I think if you want to be a supply chain professional, have an experience as a salesperson. You know, it is a real pressure job. If the product's not available, you know, if there was a promise of a service and it's not coming, that's an awful position to be in as a salesperson. And so, you know, so to really experience that, I think that that's really important. So you really understand what it's like to be a salesperson and that will improve your relationship, your communication and your understanding. And likewise, what's it really like to be in a factory? You know, often in the supply chain, you know, we send down our plan, you know, that's what I want this week, you know, you know get, get on with it. But there are people there, you know, they might be working night shifts. I've worked night shifts, that's quite tough. So, you know, experience what it's like to be on the other side. All right. So I think we cover all our questions. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with our audience, Brian. We hope that through effective communications supply chain leaders can be more visible in the organization and take up more influential roles thank you for your time thank you thank you for listening to our podcast if you like what you heard be sure to go to alcartglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview also subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest update first if you're listening to a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher, we would appreciate the kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn. So do feel free to follow me 
And if you have any suggestions on what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help. Thank you very much.